afternoon and welcome back to the highlight of this conference. It is a debate, is Earth flat or is it a globe? As you know, this is a hot topic these days and we want to assure you that no matter what is your belief on this issue, we love you. Whether you are a flatter or glober, really don't matter. To us, we love you just the same, so please don't feel bad for anything. We came here to seek truth, and sometimes we just have to uh, give facts on both sides for us to uh, see these facts and hear them for ourselves, and then we can pray about it and make up our own mind. The main thing is that we all agree on one thing. What is it? that Yeshua is alive and he's our Messiah and Savior, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. So, welcome Zen Garcia and Dr. Steve Pigeon. And I'm going to read off and remind you a little bit of uh, their uh, biographies. It was on the website, by the way, just to remind you. Zen Garcia is an advocate for the less fortunate through the non-profit Endeavor Freedom Incorporated. He has assisted the homeless, veterans, orphaned, widowed, disabled, and even animals in need. The host of two radio shows, Momentary Zen Broadcast on Revolution Radio Wednesday evenings, and then Secrets Revealed Broadcast on Truth Frequency Radio. This one is on Thursday evenings. He just recently has joined in collaboration with Laurel Austin on a new Black Talk radio show to bring awareness specifically to new parents on the dangers of vaccine toxicity and immune health issues. Zen is author of 12 books on the website. They are all listed, so please look at that. He's also founder of Sacred Word Publishing, LLC, established in November 2016 as a platform to publish and republish forgotten, out-of-print, and new author materials connected to sharing the revelation of the Word of the Most High God. So welcome, Zen. And we have Stephen Pigeon, uh, the founder, president, and chief executive officer of Sefer Publishing Group. Dr. Stephen Pigeon is a political scientist with a doctorate of philosophy and an active attorney with a Juris Doctorate in the state of Washington. In collaboration with a group of students of, of uh, scripture, he is responsible for creation and publication of the Et Sefer, Comprehensive Restoration of Sacred Scripture in the English Language. Dr. Pigeon is a student of many languages, including Greek, Hebrew, Russian, French, Spanish, and Italian. An avid reader and author, he has published over 30 books in the last several years. He has a long history of executive leadership. Uh, I'll just read a few other facts because it's quite long here. So in 2012, Dr. Pigeon was a candidate, of, a candidate for Attorney General for the state of Washington. He's a recipient of the 2008 Presidential Commission, the 2008 Reagan Congressional Commission, a two-time recipient of the Congre Congregational Medal of Distinction and a designee for the 2006 Businessman of the Year Award. Dr. Pigeon is distinguished in both who is who and who is who in business. He's an active in promoting religious freedom, economic freedom, and civil society throughout the world. In 20, 2008, Dr. Pigeon has been involved in delivering a complete restoration of sacred scripture and has recently published Behold a White Horse, Behold a Pale Green Horse, and Behold a Red Horse. Among his other works are the uh, Yom Kodesh. Well, you can kind of read it off. These are his works there. I, and I, he's also a very accomplished musician. That is kind of close to my heart because... Uh, I also am a pianist, and he's a pianist, so we have a lot to talk about, and we are like kind of talking together. We are not bad-mouthing you, I promise. 
So we are talking about piano. So he also holds a degree in piano performance and studied with Svetlana Velishko, Moscow Conservatory. Wow. Okay. Well, why don't you just read his impressive biography? It's on the website, like uh, so on. So, okay. Uh, all right. So a little bit about uh, how this debate is going to go. We are going to give each candidate a welcome, by the way. Thank you. We are blessed to have you both. We love you. And we know that this is going to be great. And what I value about these two people, that they are friends, even though they have opposing views. OK, Dr. Pigeon is going to defend global Earth. And uh, our brother Zen Garcia will be defending flat Earth. Now, we are, they're each going to have 15 minutes of their own defense. We will start with Zen. After that, we'll have minor little small break and then we are i'm going to give five random questions to each so it's a total of 10 questions they will have five minutes to respond and two minutes rebuttal with two minutes rebuttal after that we are going to have bathroom break again about 10 minutes then uh, they're going to ask each other questions of whatever they you know they know their subjects really well so I will give them a space to ask each other questions and answer them. After that session, we are going to have another bathroom break, about 10 minutes. And then at the end, we are going to have Q&A session where you will be allowed to ask questions of your choice, either candidate uh, as you wish. And I really don't know how long that will be. So when we're going to end. so. Uh, it really depends on that last session there, how, how many questions you guys have. So just keep in mind, we do need dinner. We kind of missed lunch. So we're going to start with Zen Garcia and his 15-minute defense. out there with the rest of our books that I have to hold this one. So I'm going to read and then if we have time at the end I'm going to explain how I came to the study of this topic and how I was led to this uh, realization. Um, these opening remarks will kind of touch upon a lot of different topics and introduce you to um, my understanding of it and why I do believe that the scriptures support um, a geocentric flat earth cosmology. I believe the most important realization to grasp when examining the question of whether we live in a helio or a geocentric world biblically is to recognize that the scriptures affirm undeniably that the earth is immobile, fixed, stationary, and unmoving. It was established as a foundation for the heavens and according to the order of creation in the Genesis timeline is older than the sun, moon, or the other heavenly luminaries which were made on the fourth day of the creation week and placed into, under, and beneath the solid structure of the firmament which was fitted to it on the second day. Confirmation of these postulations can be easily verified by researching what the Israelites and other ancient peoples describe about their beliefs on the cosmology prior to the invention of the heliocentric model. Even Wikipedia, which, you know, I don't believe that they are a completely trusted source, but um, they do represent a, a popular mainstream thought. When looking up the terms for biblical cosmology, they declare, quote, the ancient Israelites envisioned, envisioned uh, a universe made up of a flat disc-shaped earth floating on water, heavens above, underworld below. Of the firmament, it says, in biblical cosmology, the firmament is a structure above the atmosphere conceived as a vast solid dome. According to the Genesis narrative, God created the firmament to separate the waters above the earth from the waters below the earth. The word firmament first recorded in Middle English narrative uh, 1250 
uh, appeared in the English King James Bible, and the word is anglicized from the Latin firmamentum, used in the Vulgate in the fourth century, and thus in turn is derived from the Latin root firmus, which means firm. The word is also a Latinization of the Greek stereoma, which appears in the Septuagint, 2nd century BC. Stereoma meaning something established, stable, or steadfast with regard to the firmament means the arch of the sky, which in early times was thought to be solid, like the firmament that which has been made firm. It also means a fortified place, that which furnishes a foundation on which a thing rests firmly supported. In a military sense, a solid front. It is derived from the Greek word stereo, which means to solidify, confirm, establish, receive strength, make strong, firm or solid, strengthen, make strong. The word is derived from stereos, which itself means stiff, solid, stable, steadfast, strong, sure, firm, immovable, solid, hard, or rigid. So you, you get the idea. Uh, according to the Jewish encyclopedia, the Hebrews regarded the earth as a plain or a hill figured like a hemisphere swimming on water. Over this is arched the solid vault of the heaven. To this vault are fastened the lights, the stars. So slight is this elevation that birds may rise to and fly along its expanse. The scholarly viewpoint is affirmed by the ancient rabbinical commentaries as revealed by Lewis Ginsburg's The Legends of the Jews. In book one, he says, though the heavens and the earth consist of entirely different elements, they were yet created as a unit, like the pot and its cover. The heavens were fashioned from the light of God's garment, and the earth from the snow under the divine throne. Thus, one, worth, one earth rises above the other, from the first to the seventh, and over the seventh earth the heavens are vaulted. From the first to the seventh, the last of them, they are attached to the arm of God. The seven heavens form a unity, the seven kinds of earth form of unity, and the heavens and the earth together also form a unity. And because it has been scientifically determined that neither is the earth moving, nor is there any measurable curvature, the real question is why the global elite have lied to the rest of humanity when the occult knowledge of Earth's true orientation as a flat circular plane is clearly depicted on the United Nations banner as the seat of world government. Many here have proven and confirmed for themselves that one can see monuments like New York's Statue of Liberty which stands 326 feet above sea level on a clear day from as far as 60 miles away. If the earth were a globe, there should be 2,072 feet of curvature between Lady Liberty and the viewer making it impossible to view it from that distance. Joshua Nowicki created a sensation when he was able to snap a picture of the Chicago skyline from the shores opposite of Lake Michigan, near 60 miles away. A Chicago weatherman explained it away as a mirage due to fraction. This boast was proven false this past summer by our brother Rob Skiva and Rim Hummer when filming the city from the same side of the shore of Lake Michigan that Joshua took his picture. They rode out to the city by boat, proving that one could see it from such distance and that it was not a mirage. The Chicago skyline, like Lady Liberty, should have been some 2,072 feet below the horizon. The island of Oahu can be seen at a visual distance in excess of 90 miles away from the mainland of Kauai. At that distance, there should be over 5,400 feet or nearly a mile of curvature separating those islands. The lighthouse steeple at St. Bodo's Parish Church in Boston, 290 feet tall and visible from 40 miles away. It should be hidden behind a full 800 feet of curvature. 
All these sightings should not be possible according to the scientific formula for determining the curvature of the Earth, which according to Samuel Robotham's formula, states that for every mile traveled squared, multiplied by 8 inches divided by 12, it gives the total amount of Earth's curvature in feet. Many of you here looking into this issue have, like me, concluded that there is no movement to the Earth, nor is there any curvature. It only took me one day of serious examination into this topic to come away with not only this discernment, but knowledge that NASA cannot be trusted and that the moon landings are fictitious. Those of you here that have concluded the same know without a doubt that no matter what one thinks about the shape of the Earth, it is in no way orbiting the sun as the heliocentrists claim. No, I think I skipped it over a bit. Uh, this fact is also confirmed in the scriptures, for there is not one passage in either the biblical or the extra-biblical material which affirm motion to the earth. In fact, the opposite is true. The Bible clearly states on numerous occasions that the earth is established, fixed, stationary, and unmoving. Even the one passage which most globalists go to for support of a spherical earth, Isaiah 40:22 states in Isaiah 40:20 that the earth was repaired, prepared as a graven image and that it shall not be moved. And so Isaiah declares that the earth does not move as do the following verses, and I won't read all of them, but 1 Chronicles 16:30, Psalms 93:1, Psalms 96:10, Psalms 104:5, Isaiah 45:18, and other passages. Isaiah 40.21 then implores readers to revis revisit the Genesis narrative on the earth's establishment as a foundation for the understanding of the shape of our enclosed world system, with the firmament spread as heavenly curtain above it. Uh, he says that they form the shape of a, a tent or a tabernacle. Isaiah chooses to describe the earth with the Hebrew word chug, meaning circle, circuit, compass, or vault of heavens. He then describes the earth and the heavens together forming the shape of a tent or a tabernacle, the floor of the tent being the earth's flat surface, the walls and the roof, the vaulted sky enclosing it. Studying what the ancient Hebrews, as other peoples in the past, believed about the cosmology, they describe it as an enclosed system where the Earth's flat plane is covered over by the solid structure of the firmament. That beneath the heavenly canopy, the sun, moon, and all the other heavenly luminaries were placed on the fourth day of creation. The order of creation itself disqualifies the planetary accretion theory proposed by solid scientists as to how the solar systems came into being. For how can the earth have been created by the gravitational attraction of the sun if the sun was not even in existence until the earth was already established? The only word in the scriptures that can be applied to describe the earth as a sphere or a globe is the Hebrew word dur, meaning circle like a ball or a pile turning round about. This word can be found used in the Bible only one time, and incidentally it was used by Isaiah in chapter 22, verse 18. I'm sure that Isaiah knew, and if he had wanted to describe the earth as a globe or a sphere, and not a circle, he would have chose to use the word dur. Examining the definitions attributed to the Hebrew words for ball and circle, it is, in my opinion, self-evident that the earth is a flat circular plane and not a three-dimensional sphere. For it is only in applying this understanding that Isaiah's description of their unity as a tabernacle or a tent, that one can then make sense of such illusion. The only way to really understand this description, in my opinion, is by attributing his description of the circle of the earth as a flat plane, as I've real revealed through my books on this topic. And so no matter what one thinks about the shape of the earth and the enclosed system that we live in, 
The earth is in no way orbiting the sun at a velocity of 1,037 miles an hour. This rate of speed exceeds the speed of sound. And even bullets fired from a 22 caliber or 45 caliber pistol. Think about that for a moment. Science affirms that the earth is moving faster than the speed of sound or bullets shot from a gun. And yet there are many days when I go outside my house and the American banner which sits atop my 30 foot flagpole is completely listless and there is not the slightest movement in the wind. On sunny days such as these when one burns a pile of leaves, you can watch the smoke stream steady into the atmosphere in a straight line. Science explains this away by telling us that the atmosphere is moving with the earth and yet storm fronts here in Atlanta can arrive from any direction. Our most powerful fronts being propelled by tropical storms or hurricanes from the south while most systems visit us from the west. The water which is transferred from the air to the ground during such storms will always run off in a downward flow until finding its level, gather and trickle to form what we see as creeks, streams, ponds, lakes, rivers, and oceans. The dry land that we inhabit is that which is elevated above the sea level. Think about that for a moment as well. All the oceans of the world form one sea level. What is the horizon? It is the line at which the Earth's surface and the sky appear to meet. Our senses tell us that the Earth is flat and not moving, that the sun and the moon and the other luminaries move in circle above the face of the Earth, as depicted in the time-lapse photography of star trails moving over the course of the night. In finality, if it were the Earth which spinning in orbit around the sun that caused the sun to rise and set, why would Yahweh Elohim give Joshua the power to stop the sun and the moon in their circuits in elongating the day? Why would he give him authority over the earth and the moon if indeed it is the earth spinning which creates in perspective what we see as the sun leaving or entering our view? Also consider that the sign that is given to Hezekiah that his life would be extended was the sun moving back 10 degrees on the sundial. According to the heliocentric model, in order to make this happen, the Earth would have had to have been stopped in its orbital motion, reversed in opposite direction until the sun moved back this 10 degrees on the sundial, and then allowed to continue in revolution back the other direction. If it was the Earth's orbital motion, which was a altered in order to achieve the sun moving back, would not such occurrence have wreaked havoc upon the earth, leading to major disturbances like huge earthquakes, tsunamis, flood, and even possible pole shift. And yet there was not one repercussion duly noted in the scriptures for such having taken place. It is also for this reason that in the 12 chapters comprising the book of Enoch, Courses on the Heavenly Luminaries, there is not one verse or passage describing motion to the earth, but numerous, very detailed passages describing the sun and the moon's motion back and forth between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer. Likewise, there is not one single passage in any of the canonical or extra-biblical materials which describe earth moving, orbiting, or spinning as affirmed by the scientific experiments conducted by these once notable heliocentrists, Albert Michelson, Edward Morley, Henry Gale, George Airy, and Georges Sarna. And while their work is not shared or discussed in most universities, the research they conducted proved without a doubt that the earth is immobile and that the ether moves independently of it. Once you open yourself to new paradigm, the overwhelming amount of evidentiary truth affirms the biblical premise that neither is the earth spinning at 1,037 miles an hour or even 50 miles an hour, nor is there a single inch of deviation to support its supposed rotundity. 
Also note that canal, railway, and bridge builders, surveyors, and construction forces do not in any manner make calculation or take into consideration the supposed curvature of the earth when developing their structures but instead maintain the same precise measure of level across hundreds of miles. Am I almost done? Oh, sorry. I'll just stop there. Apologize. <laughs> you want, sure. Well, while I have you here for a few minutes, while well, Stephen's hooking up the PowerPoint, no, we'll we'll take. I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of remarks while he's doing that. <clears throat> you know, the the discussion of flat Earth versus global Earth. I don't, I'm not sure global is the best best word to use here. Maybe spheroidal might be a little bit better descriptive of the shape of the Earth. Uh, but as we talk about these terms, you know, the the flat Earth. Uh, rhetoric discusses a lot more than just merely the shape of the earth. It also discusses a really a comprehensive cosmology. And so when we look at this cosmology, we have to look at both uh, the shape of the earth, and we also have to look at what is around the earth, what is over the earth. Uh, and we also have to look at this idea of geocentric model, which is where everything revolves around the earth or a heliocentric model, which is the current scientific alternative to the geocentric model, which basically says that the Earth and the other planets in the solar system rotate instead around the sun. And as part of these questions, we could probably go on for a week looking at uh, various uh, empirical evidence to try to substantiate a scientific view one way or the other. But Primarily what we're talking about here today is more of a scriptural view in terms of what's being said in the scripture so that we as believers, because I'm, I think most of us here are coming to this from a point of view of being a believer and having faith in the word, and we have to take a look at the word and see, okay, what is actually going on here? And so this is part of what I'm going to discuss today in this PowerPoint presentation and, and uh, what our, our remarks are going to be. And so the question is, does scripture declare a flat earth? Now, if we go to the next slide here, you'll see that we're going to be discussing, hang on, let me see if I can get on the same page here with myself, which as you know, can be a difficulty. <laughs> uh, we're gonna discuss a few terms here. One of the, one of the uh, we're gonna discuss, of course, the term rakia, which means firmament, or has been uh, interpreted as firmament. We'll be discussing the word uh, tebel, and and more importantly, the uh, Hebrew term of art, which is tebel bal tamot, uh, which is a very interesting phrase. And then there's another three words uh, for foundation. It's actually one word, but there's three versions of it, which is yasad, and we'll talk about that in foundation. And of course, arba kanaf, the four corners, and hug, which is uh, defined or used in scripture as circle. Okay, let's take a look. Let's start with rakia. Now rakia, you know, it's very interesting because when I was looking at this, you know, in the Gospels, there's a passage where the Mashiach says, and I tell you the truth, that any man who says raka to his brother uh, may be guilty of the fires, you know, may, may be facing the fires of Gehenna. Well, you know, when you talk about this word raka, that's kind of the root of this word rakia. Now, rakia here is interpreted in the English Bibles as firmament, firmament. Now, we can look at the Strong's and say, well, what's the Strong say? The Strong says in expanse, the firmament, the visible arch of the sky. Now, here you have Strong saying it's the visible arch of the sky. Maybe that describes a dome over the top of the earth, but maybe it describes something else. However, Scripture is oftentimes capable of defining itself. Now let's see what it says here in Bethsheath 1.8 or Genesis 1.8. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. 
Elohim called the firmament, the rakia, heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So, and if you look closely at that passage, you will see that what is taking place is, in the creation narrative, that you have, the, that the firmament, the rakia, it is what divides the waters from the waters. Let's take a look at the next slide here. And Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay, so if the firmament is heaven, then heaven is dividing the waters above from the waters below. Heaven is dividing the waters above from the waters below. And again, a lot of times when we look at the Hebrew, we get kind of caught up in it because it can be a difficult language. It was the language of creation and it's like an, a, an onion. The more you peel off, the more you discover. And when we look at the word mime, for instance, which is the word for water, a curious word because it's in the plural, but you have this idea of mem yod, mem safit. And when you look at those three letters, mem could stand for water, and mem safit can stand for water, and in between is yod, which is the hand, you know, the hand of yah is between the waters above and the waters below. So even the word mime gives us this concept. When we talk about the heavens, we're talking about the word shamaim, the waters of salvation, shamaim. And in the waters of shamaim, here is the heaven, the firmament, which is to say that that which was in the waters above in eternity, right? Really, if you try to understand the Ein Sof without end, you're looking at this concept of an eternal, infinite Yah occupying an infinite set of dimensions infinitely. Peter calls him a consuming fire. Nothing is outside the scope of an infinite Yah, but suddenly, something is placed between the waters above and the waters below, which is the Shamaim. And the Shamaim, in the modern vernacular, we might call it the universe, the heavens. And so when we talk about a firmament, we're talking about something, establishing something that we understand as matter. We understand it as that which we see, that which we touch, that which we conceptualize, okay? Let's go to the next slide there, um, and we'll, you'll see that we see mime. You see, mem, yod, mem safit. You see that? And uh, some people teach that uh, that's actually backwards. The mem, the mem should, those mem should be reversed. Sometimes Microsoft gets me, right? They just don't want to flip, leave the, the Hebrew in the right order. But the mem, the first mem is kind of what some people would describe as the open womb. The mem safit, the closed womb, okay? So even this kind of shows the concept of, of, of the coming Mashiach. Okay, next slide, let's take a look. So oh. now... One, one comment, guys, as you're looking at this on here, when we change this over to my computer, it's, pro it's flipping the words in Hebrew. Uh, so everything you're looking at is, in Hebrew is literally backwards on the screen. Why it does that, I don't know, but that's just the way Microsoft did it in this case here. So it, when you see the ray up there, it is Reish out of Yod, not Yod out of Reish. So for some reason it's flipped it, and that's something we can't correct. Yeah, so we'll just, if you, if you can go with the flow on that with me. So when we look here at, we, I'll tell you where I came into some difficulties with this, is this passage here in Job, Job, right? Have you with him spread out the sky which is strong as a molten looking glass? Now that particular concept is reiterated by Paul later on when he says, we look through a glass darkly, right? Well, that idea of looking through a glass, really when you look at the Greek word there, you'll see that that also has the same meaning, which is kind of looking glass. We in the modern world, if you say looking glass, we say, oh, that means mirror. But does it? Maybe it means a window. I mean, how many people were blowing glass and making windows at the time of Paul? Or at the time of Job? Were there windows? But maybe there was a looking glass to which they looked and they saw something. Okay? Looking through a glass darkly. 
And so we have this same concept here. Anyway, I'm going to continue on from here. And you see that Paul in the next slide says, in quarantine we shown, or 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But you see that the word there is this esoptron, which means more like a mirror, more like a mirror, okay? So we have, again, these Hebrew words are going to become an issue. Now, let me give you an example. We're going to move on to this word. I want to, I want to keep going here. Let's go to, uh, oh, Tebel. Now, Tebel, some of the passages that Zen, mark, that Zen marked, and a lot of people have looked to it and said, well, it says clearly in a number of passages that the earth shall not be moved. Okay? But in those passages where it says the earth shall not be moved, you have this Hebrew term of art, which is Tebel Baal Tamot. And so we have to look at this. What exactly is being said here in this Tebel Baal Tamot? Now, Tebel is a difficult word because in one iteration of Tebel, it appears as confusion. So when Moses in the Torah says, a woman shall not lie with an animal, this is confusion. Now, the word there for confusion is Tebel. But you have in the same spelling in the Hebrew, you have this very same word being used when it's talking about the earth shall not be moved. Now, the earth here in this case is being referred to as Tebel, Tebel Baal Tamot. But in that phrase, let's just bounce up one more slide there. You'll see that Tebel, uh, it is described here as the earth is moist and therefore inhabited by extension, the globe. Now, even though Strong says it's the globe, at no point in Scripture was it ever interpreted as the globe. It was interpreted many times as the world, but not the globe. However, when you look at the phrase ball to mot, you see mot down here at the bottom, to waver by implication to slip, shake, or fall, to be carried, cast, to be out of course to be out of course. Now you see, for me, this, it does in fact infer an orbit. The earth shall not be out of its course, shall not be moved out of its course. Now in the Et Sefer, we say the earth shall not be moved. It's true. Is it the most true? This is always a question we deal with when we deal with converting a Hebrew word to the English word. That's true, but is it the most true? And in this case, when you're talking about this particular aspect of it, yes, this phrase could mean this tebel baltamot could mean that the earth shall not be moved out of its course. And if its course is an orbital course in a heliocentric model, and it is moved out of its orbit. I have seen recreations of this demonstrated that if it's moved out of its orbit, maybe we're talking, remember that an orbital path is kind of like um, a freeway lane. You're driving down the freeway, you got a dotted line here, you got a dotted line here. You can be up on that line, you can be up on that line, you could be in the ruts in the middle, but you're still in your lane. That's kind of what we see with an orbital path. An orbital path could be in the inside of the orbit, it could be on the outside of the orbit, but if it's bounced out of its lane, you have about two and a half years in current models before the Earth is completely out of the solar system, gone like a bad electron, right? So this Tabal Ben Tomot does give us pause. Okay, let's continue. Tabal Bal Tomot, Tebel Bal Tomot. Okay, let's move on to this. Oh yeah, here we go, Yasad. Now this becomes an important word. And again, a lot of people say, well, you know, Steve, you know, well, let's talk about your Hebrew credentials. Well, you know, when we talk, it's one thing to be credentialed in Hebrew, it's another thing to look at the linguistics of the language, which is more what we do at Et Sefer. And I'll give you an example, and I know some of these words get kind of hard, but Yasad is really this root word. Mossad and Mossada are derived from it. But Yasad means foundation. Now, 
You guys remember the passage in the gospel that says, and I tell you the truth, this generation shall not pass away. You remember? This is in the Olivet Sermon. This generation shall not pass away before these things happen. And people say, well, that means 70 years. And some people will say, well, David said 40 years. Therefore, if we calculate from, you know, 1967, or if we calculate from 1947, we've got some answer. But the truth is, it doesn't mean any of that. Because when we're talking about generation, we're not talking about my generation, like Roger Daltrey from The Who would say, even though he could possibly mean this, all right? We're talking about the generative aspect of the seed. And he says, this generation shall not pass away. You know, there's an olive tree on the Mount of Olives right now that's been around for over 2,000 years. Okay? That olive tree has been there, was probably there when Mashiach prayed. Same tree. When you look at a tree, you see this kind of idea of generation. You have the tree growing, but every year leaves come out and leaves fall off. If it's your first year witnessing a tree, you're saying that tree's dead. And then the following spring, the, the, the buds come up, the leaves come out. And maybe if you're dealing with an apple tree, after a couple of years, fruit starts to show up. And the fruit has its generation, and it's picked, and it falls, and so forth. But what you're talking about with the generation of the apple tree is you're not talking about this set of leaves that are alive right now. You're talking about the whole generation of the apple tree. And so really what he is saying, or what Mashiach is saying in generation, is he's saying this generation, that is to say the generation of the house of Yasharel, the firstborn of Yah is the seed of Yasharel. Now, I know you guys are probably used to hearing the word Israel, but I use the word Yasharel, which means the upright in Yah. Yasharel. This seed, the seed of Yasharel, this generation shall not pass away. Now we have the same kind of concept here with foundation. You see, in the modern vernacular, we hear foundation, we think, well, that's kind of like a concrete form that you put underneath your house, right? Put a foundation in. That's not what's here at all. What you have here under this idea of yasad is founding. You see, when you look at yasad, to set, intensively to found, to sit down together, to settle, to consult. You see, it means to found. So when you're talking about, if I said, well, look, I'm going to found six companies this afternoon. Actually, I did five two weeks ago, but that's another story. But if I founded five companies, and I'm creating, I go on the website, and I put in all the data, and I create these companies. If I found those companies, you could call that collectively a foundation. My act of founding all of these companies would be a foundation. Now, so the word, when I look at the word foundation, where it appears in the Sefer, that is the correct word to be there, foundation. The question is, what does it mean? And I say to you that, that the, what it says there in that place where you find foundation is that it means the founding of, the collective founding of. The foundation of the earth is the collective founding of the earth. It is what, and so the best way to understand the foundation of the earth is to go back to Genesis 1 and see the seven days of creation. And in those seven days of creation, you will see the foundation of the earth. Okay. Mossad and Mossada, I get into kind of a technical issue on this, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip it for now. But it's really not Mossad or Mossada, because if you look in the Hebrew, you'll see that a, vav, a, a yod looks like this, yod, then vav, then nun safit. Right? How deep is the line? Well, I don't know, but if it's not on a line page, you might mistake the vav for a yod. And if it was a yod, then you see it's ma yasad, you see? But it comes from the same root. They admit it comes from the root. Okay, let's move up to, let's, let's move up to matsuk, matsuk on the PowerPoint. How are we, how are we doing? Okay, well, then I'm going to conclude my remarks by saying, Baruch Baba Shem Adonai. You got it? <laughs> Okay, is everybody okay? All right. 
We're going to continue in this debate, and we have um, five questions for each candidate. They are random questions, uh, not necessarily logically tied or anything to one another. It's just a random questions. And each one will have five minutes to answer with two-minute rebuttal. And there will be no mercy on time here because um, it will be five minutes and that's it. Okay. I will, I'll, when it's one minute, I'm going to tell you one. So you know you have one minute, right? And then, or if you watch Steve, he can raise his hand and tell you, you know what? Yeah. But when, as, as soon as he tells me, this sign, I'm cutting you off because otherwise it would be too, too long, okay? All right. Question number one for Steve Pigeon. According to Psalm verse 1045, the earth was established on its foundation so it can never be moved. How do you explain this particular verse in view of your belief that the earth is a rotating globe? Don't start the clock yet. I haven't started talking. <laughs> yeah, Psalm 104.5 is, is, again, one of those passages that is, uh, deals with really two concepts. One is foundation, of course, and the other is shall not be moved. And that is one of those verses that has this phrase, tebel bal tamot, in it. And so what you see is, is, number one, the foundation of the earth. Actually, I think Psalm 104.5 does not use the word yasad. It uses the word makon uh, for, for foundation. But in any respect, what you see there is a, ba a tebel bal tamot could generously be used to say the globe, lest it is moved from its course. Now, so, so much of what we talk about here in terms of what's being said is, does this tamot mean just not moved or not moved out of its course? And the, if it's not moved out of its course, that means it has a course, and that course, of course, would be the orbit. And so if it's in orbit, then it cannot be moved out of its orbit. Now, I think that scientifically that's a fact. If it is moved out of its orbit, it gets moved out of the solar system. That doesn't mean it can't move along side to side within its orbit, because its orbit is not a pure circle as originally conceived, but rather it's an elliptical circuit. And even then it has out of roundness that is not easily defined. We'll talk about this more when we get to the question on Joshua's long day, which I'm sure we'll get to. But in terms of foundation, again, remember foundation is the cumulative joining of the founding. So when you're talking about the founding of the earth, can it be moved out of its course? And again, another meaning could be when you're talking about the seven days of creation, are those seven days of creation out of their course? No, this is not the case. But in all four verses where you see Tebel Bal Tamot, you have the, exactly the same issue. Does it mean shall not be moved, as in it's sitting here and is not moving at all? Or does it mean that it's not moved out of its course? And that's the position that I'm taking, that in fact the passage does mean not moved out of its course, totally consistent with both the heliocentric model and with a spheroidal model of the Earth moving in an orbit around the Sun. I'll reserve whatever minutes I have left. in any manner and also um, there's no other verses in the biblical or extra biblical materials which affirm such motion to the earth Enoch describes in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries um, that it's the sun and the moon, as it says in Psalms 19, and the other stars and luminaries which move in circuit above the earth. And again, um, I don't see any motion, even visually, what we observe 
uh, with the, my flag. The earth is not moving, especially not at 1,037 miles an hour, uh, faster than a bullet, and also that of the speed of sound. We were great on timing here, so let's see. Uh, question for Zen. How does flat earth adjust to, for tides and tidal flows? This is a geographical question. Uh, uh, in my newest book on paradise, I describe how at the very center of the Earth's plane, there is what is referred to in the scriptures as the bottomless, the abysmal chasm. And it talks about that there's this magnetic mountain called Rupus Negra, which means black rock. And then surrounding this is a, a vortex, which leads into the interior of the Earth. And it describes that every six hours, the course, the, the motions of the tidal rhythms back reverse back and forth so that it at one point sucks all the waters of the ocean and drops them in waterfall into the interior of the earth. And then six hours later, it spews them out. And so, in my opinion, rather than the moon causing this, supposedly according to its gravitation, this tidal effect, uh, the ancient explorers, and I s explained this in great detail in my book, talking about this bottomless pit, this abysmal chasm. It is this particular phenomenon. Uh, it's also described in the Greek mythology as a sea monster called Charbertus, and it's described as a giant whirlpool. And in my opinion, this is what is causing the tidal rhythms. And it, it, when it spews it out, it causes the high tide. Six hours later, it sucks all the waters of the ocean and, uh, in, and uh, that causes low tide. And it does this um, over the yeah. course um, uh, twice. Uh, in cycle twice a day. We're done. OK. Would you like your time for rebuttal? Yes, sir. Let us see. Well, I think that the model that we currently have talking about tides being formed by the moon is a very good model showing that the moon orbits and that what you have is you have basically a pulling when the moon gets within close proximity, the water falls back, and then it does, it has one reciprocal. And we see that as the tidal model. But with the time model, we have a real difficulty with the flat earth theory. Because the flat earth theory postulates that the sun is rotating inside of a closed firmament, which is a dome over the, over the earth, and that you have the sun and the moon rotating. And, and there's a whole bunch of problems with that theory. And uh, one of them, which is the solar eclipse, especially if the sun and the moon are the same size. But where we really run into a problem is we know, and it can be proved empirically very quite easily, that the city of Ka'anach, which is a city in Greenland, and it's on the northern end of Greenland, is in the same time zone as Cape Horn in South America. And so you've got a real issue here, and it's like the international dateline runs North Pole to South Pole, and similarly you have the same idea with the sunlight. Now that is consistent with a spheroidal Earth that, the, that a sun is shining on and lighting up from pole to pole. As for instance, when you look at the moon and you see a sliver moon or a quarter moon, you'll see that that curvature goes from the top, of the, the, the top pole of the moon to the bottom pole of the moon, demonstrating that the light is reflecting upon what is a spheroidal moon and you have a similar circumstance on the earth that you can see that we're getting a spheroidal illumination from the sun because the time zone goes from the north pole to the south pole question for steve <laughs> question for steve if this earth is rotating, which causes uh, the sun to set, why did Yahweh give Joshua the authority to stop the sun and the moon and not the earth and the moon? 
this is a question, and I knew this question was coming, and I'm just going to kind of explain my theory on it. What we see when we look out and we say the sun in its circuit, which David refers to and Hanok refers to, the sun in its circuit, whether the earth rotates around the sun or the sun rotates around the earth, to us the perception would be exactly the same. In other words, if you and I walked out in, the, out in this parking lot and I started walking around you this way, at some point I'm going to be to your right. But if you started walking around me, at some point I'm going to be to your right. And so the perception is exactly the same, whether the earth rotates around the sun or the sun rotates around the earth. Now, when I, when I was arguing this, when I looked at this initially, Galileo is the one that made this argument in front of the Pope. And he was imprisoned and died and spent the rest of his life trapped in his house because he postulated that the earth rotated around the sun. And his proof was that there are phases, like moon phases, on Venus and Mercury. That is to say, you see a dark Venus and you see a full Venus, which would be consistent with Venus and Mercury orbiting around the sun. So in Joshua's long day, as I mentioned before, if you're driving on the freeway, you could be pretty close to the dotted line here, or you can be in the middle, or you could be towards that line over there. And I believe that the Earth was pushed from a 364-day orbit around the sun and pushed out to a 365-day orbit. And if you calculate that, you will see that that does reflect, in fact, a 12-hour delay in the time. On Earth, it would perceive as the sun standing still because the Earth is being pushed out in its orbit. But as it's being pushed out in, into its outer orbital sphere, you would see it as the sun standing still. But we know that there was an anomaly that went from Enoch and Jubilee, say, in a 364-day year to where we are now at a 365 and a quarter day year. We know there's an anomaly because if you stay on the 364-day year, you'll be 30 days off in 30 years, and in 90 years, you'll be planting your corn in December. So we know that there's an anomaly there. And that anomaly, I believe, took place in Joshua's longer day and was actually attuned when you get to the Hezekiah sundial rolling back. Brother Zem, would you like your time to rebut? Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, again, the earth is not moving and this has been verified by scientific experimentations by Morley, Gale, Sagnac, Airy, all of them affirm that there is no motion to the earth. Um, and that he says the heavens are moved by his direction and obey him. Day and night accomplish the course assigned to them by him without hindrance one to another. The sun and the moon and the dancing stars, according to his appointment, circle in harmony within the bounds assigned to them. And so the reason Joshua was given over the sun and the moon uh, is, again, because it is not the earth which is circling and orbiting or moving. Oh, you mean like this? Okay, sorry. All right, and so it's not, it's because the earth is not moving, and that's why the sun and the moon circling above the face of the earth, that's why Joshua was given authority over the sun and the moon to stop them. Um, and the same thing with the book of Enoch, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries. Uh, Enoch describes the sun and the moon and the other heavenly luminaries having motion. There's not one verse, not one passage attributed to the motion of the earth as it says in the Bible that the earth is established that it shall not be moved. Question for Zen. How does flat earth explain water currents like the Gulf Stream and air currents like the jet stream? The air currents and also the wind currents, the jet streams, when you look at um, the way that the Earth is laid out as a disk, we see that 
when the sun moves back and forth, as is also described in the Book of Enoch, between the tropics of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, as it goes over the topography of the earth, where the heat and the temperature rises, it causes the winds and the airflow to change, and that's what drives storm production, the creation of rain, the, the pushing of the storms across the different topography uh, all over the face of the earth. And we can see this even um, with the description of the, six, the sun moving through the six gates of heaven, that even the seasons change, uh, that when the sun is located above the equator, we have equal day and night, and as it moves closer towards the Tropic of Cancer, that is in the northern latitudes, summer. And then when it moves back southward after the summer solstice, once it reaches the equator again, that is when the autumnal equinox happens, we have equal 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. It moves into southern latitudes. That is winter for us because the the day is getting uh, diminishing, the night is getting longer, but that is also summer and spring for the southern latitudes. And so we you know, see this reflected, and Enoch talks about this in great detail. Uh, I deciphered this and published it as my ninth book, uh, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. You can find all of that uh, in great elaboration within that book. Would you like your time to rebut? Well, I see the this uh, discussion on the, on the luminaries in Enoch as being consistent with the axial movement of the Earth. And again, when we say that if you were to look out, seeing the sun orbiting around the Earth gives the exact same appearance to we on the Earth as the Earth orbiting around the sun. We have an interesting situation that when, when Enoch talks about the 12 gates, it's very clear that the sun is moving up and then it moves back to the vernal equinox and it moves below and it moves back to the equinox. But in that series and in that progression and in the gates of the moon, it, it, we have a similar discussion, all of which really describe uh, what is going on with an earth moving. Now, let me just share this with you. When we talk about time, for instance, Time exists only because we have something in motion affixed to something else. If there was no motion, there would be no time. And we have a, a very interesting problem with what we see in the, in the flat Earth model with the sun orbiting inside the firmament, because really we don't have any solid equation for what is a year, other than to say this is the anniversary of where the sun has appeared once before in its circuit. We have an interesting anomaly that when you say, even though the sun has moved up and is creating summer in the northern hemisphere, again, consistent with the axial movement of the globe, where the globe leans this way towards the sun or away from the sun, with that axial movement, that's a very interesting anomaly because, again, you see the time zones remain consistent from north pole to south pole, even in that axial motion. So even when you're having a change in the seasons, if I'm in the same time zone in Anchorage, Alaska, as somebody is in, in the Fiji Islands, even if I'm in the middle of winter and they're in the middle of summer, and it's going to be something like that unless it's right over the equator, it's consistent with the idea of the Earth rotating. The Earth rotating in space and moving at 1,000 miles an hour, it's, it's moving against nothing. It's not, there's no pressure there to create these windstorms or something. It's a discrete system. In other words, if I, if I had a ball that was completely enclosed in glass, and I took it, and I spun it in a pool, the water in, outside the pool is not going to cause any distortion inside that which is inside the glass. See, I could spin it all day long, and my little globe model of Seattle with the space needle isn't going to be affected by that at all. Question for Brother Steve. If Earth is a globe, how it is cited in Scripture as having four corners? Oh, yes. The four corners question. I love this question. 
I was going to get to it in the PowerPoint, but I ran out of time because I was too long-winded. This discussion of four corners, in the phrase in the Hebrew is arba kanaf, kanaf. And I've written a long blog about this on the Sefer website. You can see it uh, where I talk about this. And I actually created a table to graph it out. Kanaf actually refers to uh, the wings, like the wings of a bird. And this becomes really important, like when you talk about uh, in Daniel, there's prophecies about the ends of the temple, right? And it's talking about the kanaf on the wings, right? On the wings. And it's so much associated with wings that in some cases it's it's translated as feathered. So the, the vast majority of the time that the word kanaf appears, it appears as the ends of a wing, the tip of a wing. And so you're talking about the four wings of the earth. How does this mean that the, that the earth is suspended on wings in the firmament? You know, in Job it says the, that the earth hangs on nothing, hangs on nothing. And when you look at this, when you look at the idea of the four wings, what you're talking about, and what I believe Isaiah was talking about when he's talking about the four corners, he's talking about north, south, east, and west. And he's basically what he's trying to say is from the farthest north, from the farthest east, from the farthest west, and from the farthest south, not four corners. And of course, you have a problem when you say the earth is a circle like a disc and not a square, that you don't have four corners on a disc, right? Uh, in my opinion, the true orientation of the earth is well known by the elites. And one of the depictions of that we can find on the flag of the United Nations where it shows the earth circling around the northern plain. But I also believe that the whole symbology of the square and the compass is connected to the fact, as it says in Proverbs, where um, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth, that the square, the, I mean, the circle of the earth, was inscribed upon a square. And so that the, the square and the compass is also symbology of the fact that the circle was inscribed upon the square, which would explain the four corners uh, in, the, in the Bible, and also Isaiah 40, the description of the circle of the earth. Um, understanding the real orientation and that the elitists know this and that's why they show and depict it in their symbology that it helps us to decipher the true meaning of what they are uh, hiding in plain sight. Uh, question for Brother Zen. Is the moon a disk and the sun a disk or are they spheres? They are described in the scriptures as orbs. Um, and so I think, you know, really with all of us learning and having to reconsider all that we thought we knew, most certainly further examination needs to be applied to these things. But there are also videos and people that have done uh, videos where they've captured uh, luminaries and stars being seen through the moon. And so whether that's true or not, um, I, I don't know, but there's a lot to reconsider since this is such a huge paradigm shift for all of us. And questions like that and even things with um, in the Rahu and Ketu and what Enoch calls the lesser moon and its connections to the lunar eclipses, all those kind of things have to be reconsidered and we're still learning a lot. But um, and so this is one of those kind of things that we really have to examine further um, and open our minds to uh, just learning more to get further and clarity on this kind of issue and, and many others. Well, I do like your answer on that, Zen, because I do think there is a lot to be learned and I don't think we have the answers. I don't think we have all the answers in any respect. And. Uh, I think as we explore, and one of the things that Zen mentioned in his opening remarks is about the distrust of NASA. And I have a, a great distrust of NASA myself. I just, you know, I mean, the government lies to us. I mean, it's a given, and they get paid to do it. And now it's really nothing but disinformation. So it's a huge problem. I want to congratulate the Flat Earth people for taking the time to make what we in the legal business call a collateral challenge on existing knowledge. It's good to make a collateral challenge. Now, I think that we have 
very clear and obvious evidence that the that the earth uh, that the moon is a sphere because you see it in the sliver moon in the quarter moon etc we know it's at least round when you see the full moon but you know when you're seeing the sliver moon that you have this this reflection that goes from north to south and the inferences and it's a readily identifiable model you can do it at home if you want where you can take a ball and you can circle it around a lamp and you will see that the ball in a, in a in a dark room maybe using a you know a certain kind of bulb you'll see that the the back side of the ball darkens up as it comes around and depending on your perspective that you're going to get illumination from the north to the south pole so it infers the sphere is it a reflection is it something we can see through is it something else could be some people have said that it's a man-made uh, satellite that's thin, that it rings like a bell. I mean, I've heard a lot of theories on the moon, right? But I believe we can see with the visual evidence that it is, in fact, spheroidal. And, and in addition, we can also see this with the sun by calculating what it is that orbits around the sun, which means you can do it with your own, your own home telescope, although you've got to be careful looking at the sun, right? But you can see the orbit of Venus and the orbit of Mercury around the sun, you can't see the uh, a moon phase on Jupiter or Saturn because of what they call a, a the uh, a superior orbit. That's to say it's outside the Earth's orbit. That's why you don't see any moon phases there. And this is why you get the conclusion that you got from Galileo and you got from Copernicus and others that in fact it's a heliocentric model. Now bear in mind that Pythagoras and even Isaac Newton were geocentric modelists, right? Both of those guys held to a geocentric model. But Galileo and Copernicus and others moved into a heliocentrism. And in the heliocentrism now has a great deal of capability in predicting the location of stars, the location of planets, the locations of comets, the performance of a comet as it comes around the sun, and so on and so forth. And predictability is one feature we can look to to make a determination as to what in fact is the case. Brother Steve, does the Bible say that the sun and moon move in circuit above the face of the earth? Yes. David says it and Hanok says it. And again, I mean, I will come back to this because when you're talking about this saying that it moves in a circuit above the earth, in our perception, that's exactly what happens. Does that mean, does that explain the geophysics of what's going on. Maybe, maybe not. If you recall, and I talked about this with the, on NYS TV the other day, when you go back and look at, at Egyptian hieroglyphics, you'll see that the Egyptian hieroglyphics are very two-dimensional, right? You look at people on the wall, they're very two-dimensional. But as you begin to move past the, into the Greek culture, you start to see three-dimensional art emerging and the three-dimensional art begins to show depth and the depth perception and we see more of that as we get farther and farther into the artwork. Well, the artwork is only explaining what's happening in our minds. And so if you take somebody who has a two-dimensional view of the world, they see the world in, a two, in, a, in two dimensions. When you begin to explain three dimensions, it's possible to see three dimensions. Salvador Dali did a painting of Mashiach on the cross depicting it in four dimensions in four dimensions. Now, is it a four-dimensional shot? No, but it attempts to depict four dimensions. And so when we see this, when you talk about what the scripture says about the circuit of the sun, the circuit of the sun, if the earth is orbiting around the sun, or if the sun is orbiting around the earth, to perception of man, it's the identical appearance. We perceive it the same whether it's one way or the other. We perceive it, we would perceive it the same if the Earth was orbiting around the Sun or the Sun orbiting around the Earth. We would see it the same. The question is, does the geocentric model answer the questions about the significance of the universe? And because one of the, one of the critical issues we see is, is the Sun and the Moon the same size? Again, it says so in Enoch, the Sun and the Moon are the same size. But we're going to have a solar eclipse here on August 21st. Now, if the sun and the moon are the same size, then they would collide. For the moon to get in front of the sun implies that to some degree, the sun is bigger than the moon, and the moon is smaller than the sun. 
even if it's just by a couple of feet, that implication is there. One is behind the other. And if one is behind the other, how far behind? And if one is bigger than the other, how much bigger? And if we were to do a scalar model like this, where we put a point on four points and scale it out, well, it could be 90 million miles. Could be. And given that the pyramids predict that it's 90 million miles, and the pyramids predict the circumference of the Earth, and the pyramids predict the distance of the moon, maybe NASA used the pyramids to get its number. I don't know. But I think we can see that although Enoch tells us the sun and the moon are the same size, and we look and we see they are the same size, they can't be the same size in a discrete system or they'd hit together. With regard to the sun and the moon, um, Enoch also describes that the lower heavens beneath the vaulted dome, that they are divided into seven concentric rings. And he describes that the seven, what are called the planets of the universe are the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn. And he also attributes that each one of them is on a different level of the, what is the seven concentric rings. And so if the sun and the moon are on these different levels and looking upward, we see them cross, uh, well, right above one or the other. And we're looking upward, they wouldn't hit each other, but they would, um, crossing past, we would see them as uh, eclipsed in such manner. Now, with regard to the circular movement and course of the, the sun, there's a phenomenon called the midnight sun where the sun over, when it reaches the summer solstice and, and is near the Tropic of Cancer, if you are in anywhere near these extreme northern latitudes, you can watch the sun over the course of multiple days go from east to west and then back in a circle to the east. And for 72 hours, it will remain above the horizon and not ever dip down below any of the moons or anything that might obstruct its view. And so you can clearly see every year that the sun is moving in a circular movement and you can't explain that away according to the heliocentric model because if it's the earth which is spinning eastward um, and that that's what causes the sun to rise and to set the sun could never take a position where it's moving back towards the north and returns back to the east in circle to reach its point of origin and so in my opinion uh, the only way that this phenomena can be explained and which is observable every year is to apply it to its circular motion as Clement and Enoch and so many others convey even Psalms speaks about the sun moving as a bridegroom um, in a in a circuit. Brother Zen, how do you explain time zones which are longitudinal across the proposed globe? Once you understand how the sun um, is moving and the moon is moving in a circle above the earth and that the earth is a like a giant flat disc august picard described it as a flat disc with upturned edge these every 15 degrees of the 360 degrees that creates like a pie like the slices of of, of a pizza these are what create the time zones and so as the sun is circling and moving through um, because when it rises in the east, it moves in a, uh, across the southern skies towards the west. Reaching the vanish, vanishing point, it disappears uh, and looks like it sets, according to our perspective. And then it describes it moving northwards and back to the east. And so it will be nighttime for us, but then daytime for the other half of the 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 other portion of the earth and so when you divide the the pie into these different divisions that's what creates the time zones and also it's the same thing for circumnavigation of the earth they are just moving in a circle around it rather than 
you know, going around it as if it was a, a sphere. And so people can look to the model. Even our friend Rob Skiba created with the Stellarium by applying uh, the motions that are attributed to this in Stellarium to the movements of the sun and the moon. Uh, he shows us, um, and I decoded this with the, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, exactly how this is occurring and that the sun as it moves into the southern latitudes, it has to speed up in order to maintain uh, equivalency with one 24-hour day. And as it is moving northward and closing near the Tropic of Cancer, it is moving slower in rotation, which is also um, during in the Arctic summer, the sun moves very slow and it causes just a tremendous amount of uh, changes. Uh, everything grows really quickly during that time. All the trees and the mosses, everything comes into bloom. And it is during that time that all the creatures there in the Arctic have their breeding season. And so, and again, you can witness this with the midnight sun phenomena. Well, I believe, I believe that this might just kind of uh, intermittent here. Yeah, hold on here a second. Okay, the um, no, I believe that the question is better answered with the uh, with the global model, and I think it is better answered with the global model in this respect that when you have the axial movement of the Earth, the axial movement being that the pole moves this way and moves this way, and that this takes place over a period of a year, and the year being calculated to the anniversary when the Earth com completes its orbit around the Sun and arrives at the same position, which is, uh, I think, a good reason to have a year. You know, having grown up in Alaska, I can tell you I've seen the midnight Sun, and in the midnight sun, and, and uh, Zen is right, in the growing periods, things grow significantly, but they grow significantly because you have 16 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours, and sometimes 24 hours of daylight. And so the, the and also that they're sitting in volcanic soil too also helps, but, you know, so when you're talking about this, when he says the sun speeds up when it goes around the, the outer perimeter of the earth, well, they would necessarily have to do that. You're talking about something that cannot be witnessed in really anywhere else in the solar system or anywhere else, even in the subatomic space where you see something speeding up like that inside of an orbit. What you do see consistently in the subatomic world, in the quantum world, and also what you see consistently in the observable astronomy is you see a consistent orbit and consistent orbit speed along ellipses. And so when we look at the axial motion of the Earth, ignore the vacuum cleaner in the different in the other room there. If you, if you look at the axial motion of the Earth, this would explain the sun not setting because when the pole is looking at the when the pole is looking at the sun like this, the Earth is spinning here. The sun is illuminating it this way, and so you would see the sun not go below the horizon, which you don't in Barrow. But when the axial is pointed this way, by the way, there is no sun. The sun goes down in October and doesn't come up until April if you're up at Barrow. Now, in addition to that, it does predict the time zone compared to the pie chart. My difficulty with the pie chart is, is that you're saying that somehow the sun's light, which is now no longer spherical, in other words, if we took a laser type flashlight and shined it on a circular surface, we'd have some kind of a beam here that we could move around in the circle. But how does that suddenly become a pie-shaped beam without some kind of a lens being on top of the sun that's going to articulate the light to be in a particular kind of pie-shaped focus? So now we have to have a lens. Now we have to have the sun moving at different speeds depending on its orbit, so on and so forth, compared to a model that shows the sun being fixed, the Earth rotating around it, and in an orbit moving on its axis, moving in its axial motion. I think that's the better predictor. Brother Steve, if the earth is a globe, how is it that scriptures say that when Christ returns, every eye shall see him? As lightning is from the east to the west, right? Now, there's uh, one of our brothers out here, a fellow named Gil Broussard, has done a great deal of research on his uh, planet 7X 
you may not accept Planet 7X, and I know a lot of the a lot of the FE group does no longer accepts the notion of Planet 7X. But a lot of his physics uh, go to this question, and I think a lot of his physics uh, answer this question, which is that if you had if you had a Planet 7X come in, if you had some significant electromagnetic sphere that was doing it, that was rogue in its ellipse and it comes around the sun and it gets into near orbit with the earth that is to say suppose you had a planet seven times the size of the earth pass between the moon and the earth the kind of electromagnetic discharge that would take place between the two planets would be significant and huge and it would be such that there would be electronic voltage, literally, lightning from the east to the west, connecting the two planets. So when you're talking about seeing Mashiach come in, every eye will see. And it's kind of the similar question when you ask, uh, well, I won't answer that question. But when you're talking about seeing Mashiach, that every eye will see him approaching. You know, the scriptures go on to even say that men's hearts shall be failing them from fear. They shall be fainting from fear with seeing what's coming upon the earth. My personal opinion, we're close to seeing this. I think we're very close to seeing this. Uh, I think this generation shall not pass away before we see this. And I think that, uh, uh, and I do believe that there is, um, yeah, when you're talking about every eye will see it, all that means is that the lightning is going to appear from east to the west for more than 24 hours, and then every eye will see it. In my opinion, the reason why Nebuchadnezzar in his dream, Daniel described it being able to be seen from all the ends of the earth, and the same thing applies to the reason every eye shall see Christ when he returns, is because we are all on this flat disk, and upwards is the same for all of us. And so when he comes down from what is described as the north, it is possible for all eyes to see and it's uh, also the same thing where uh, when he was tempted and Satan took him up to an exceedingly high mountain it's my opinion this mountain is this Rupus Nigra the black rock this magnetic mountain also called Mount Sumeru Mount Meru Mount Olympus that this mountain does exist in the very center of the earth plane it's described as the tallest mountain in the world, the highest peak, and that it is also this place that um, Christ was taken to when he was shown all the kingdoms of the world. And the same thing with John in his description of seeing New Jerusalem descend out of the heavens. In the scriptures, it describes it as occurring in the north. And he also, in that same vision, saw the angel descend down into the bottomless pit. And as I describe in this new book also on paradise, the bottomless pit is this giant whirlpool which is located in the center of the earth's plain surrounding this Mount Smeru, this exceedingly high mountain. And it is this whirlpool which causes the tides. It reverses course every six hours and it creates the high and the low tides. And that this is the reason why it says in the scriptures that when he returns, just as New Jerusalem descends out of the north, that every eye shall be able to witness, because upward is the same for all of us on the plane of the earth. How do you explain the moon phases which demonstrate a spherical shadow? Well, in my opinion, the moon, it, it exhibits its own light. And the way that it is established is that every day it is 50 minutes behind the sun in its rotation, in its revolution. And so as it, um, as it falls behind, it goes through these different phases. And Enoch talks about this in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries talking about the lesser luminary and I explain all of these movements um, and all of these phases because he describes it that over the course of 15 days 
it goes from what is the lunar conjunctive phase to full moon. And it shows us, because uh, when the moon is full, it is in the opposite side. Um, so when the sun is setting in the west, the full moon is rising in the east. And so all of these motions are described by the Book of Enoch, and it explains exactly what we see as the phases of the moon. And the, the lunar calendar, which is also encoded and talked about in the Book of Enoch, it is connected to also the determination of Sabbath. Um, and that most people don't understand that Kadesh and the seven day, the four remaining seven day sabbatical weeks, that they are also connected to the phases of the moon. And so this is a very important study uh, because Sabbath doesn't occur every seven days. It actually is aligned to when the first sliver of the moon is visible and then the determination of Kadesh is what creates the determination of Sabbath. And so I do encourage people to examine and to look into this as well because um, Sabbath is not every Sunday or every Saturday or even from Friday to Saturday evening as so many people study and uh, worship and celebrate it. Brother C. Well, I'm going to have to address this backwards. Um, you know, in Enoch, in uh, uh, chapter 92:12, it talks about in the, the latter generation, there'd be an evil generation rise up. But to the elect, Yah would give the doctrine, the sevenfold doctrine of creation. And I think the sevenfold doctrine of creation, we've kind of discussed about the seven heavens and the seven luminaries and so on and so forth. There are seven words which begin Genesis 1-1. Uh, there are, uh, you know, if you look at the, the book of Revelation, it's seven sections of seven. You have seven feast days. Uh, the, the seven is the number of the completion of Yah. He worked six days and rested on the seventh. And I think this working six days and resting on the seventh is what gives us Shabbat. Now, Unfortunately, there is a real controversy that's broken up with Enoch Jubilees and the calendar. And a lot of people have said, well, Stephen, you shouldn't have included Enoch and Jubilees in the Sefer because it creates a calendar controversy. It can, although I don't believe it does. And the reason I don't is because those books declared a 364-day year. And I believe at the time those books were written, it was a 364-day year. And I do believe that at that time, the Earth was in a slightly different orbit or, or a different portion of its orbit that gave us a 364-day year and that the Earth and the, or the, the Sun and the Moon were in harmony with one another to, to tell us exactly the rhythm of life that was given in the calendar of Enoch, which is a 364-day calendar that's 30, 30, and 31, and that the Moon was consistent with all of those periods. But Enoch goes on to say that they are going to rebel and that, and that they're going to move. And, and even as Enoch says that time will be shortened and as Mashiach says time will be shortened, but that's not talking about the calendar year being shortened, okay? That's not talking about, it's talking about the times being shortened. And so what you see is I believe that there is a seventh day, a seven day rhythm to the Sabbath. And people say, well, how do you know what day is Saturday? Or how do you know what day is Shabbat? Well, you know, in 165 nations around the earth, the word for Saturday is Sabato, Sabado, Sabudo, Shabbat, and so on and so forth. Even in Italian, it's Sabato, right? And so you have a question of the seventh day Sabbath and that rotation, and I do believe that that rotation is consistent with the sevenfold doctrine of his whole creation. And so in terms of the moon, when we talk about seeing the moon, uh, the sliver of the moon and so forth. Enoch describes the beginning of the month as the dark moon, the new moon, as does Psalm 81.3. And Brad and I went through that passage for three months looking at this word showing the dark moon. But the dark moon only lasts for three and a half hours, right? So the sliver moon and the dark moon are going to happen in the same night. And so it, it's, it's kind of immaterial. But what it what does become material is, is that we live in a, we live in a world that is, uh, I think, but I think this is part of what the flat Earth movement is all about. 
we live in a world that doesn't have every question answered. And so we seek to find those answers. Uh, but for me, the seventh day Sabbath is, is a seven day rotation. Well, thank you very much. We have concluded the second phase of the debate. The third phase is what I call the dialogue. <laughs> so uh, after 10 minute break, we're going to come back and we have Zen and Steve asking questions themselves. And please just don't go over 45 minutes, okay? They will have uh, dialogue here.